Good afternoon, everyone. Um, please welcome our next speaker, Joyce Werner, who's come a long way from Kansas City. She just drove up with us this morning, and uh, she's going to talk about practical preservation today. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the uh, Technical Services Roundtable notification to talk about uh, practical preservation techniques. I'm an archivist at the National Archives of Kansas City. Um, we are one of 13 regional facilities of the Records, uh, National Archives of Records Administration, and we hold records from, we hold permanent records from uh, U.S. history courts and field offices of federal agencies in the states of Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, and Minnesota. So uh, you have researchers who need those kinds of records, you send them to me, and we help them. Um, we also we have lots of Bureau of Indian Affairs records, including uh, the Winnebago Agency, which I just led the team on arranging and describing those records this past year. So um, I feel a little kinship to Nebraska these days uh, from having done that. But today I'm going to talk about preservation techniques. I am uh, the person in charge of preservation at the National Archives of Kansas City. Um, and being a federal employee, that means I take um, readings and submit reports and collect statistics and such. But it also means that I'm the person, when we run into something that's falling apart, I'm supposed to know what to do with it. And so um, sometimes I make it up. <laughs> but, you know, there really are some very basic sorts of things that we fall back. And so a lot of those really are very applicable to libraries in general. Um, I come into the archives profession with an undergraduate history <laughs> with an MLS uh, from Emporia State. I have been a school librarian, I've been a uh, congregational librarian and a bookstore retailer. Uh, I wrote a column for School Library Journal for years, I just dropped that a couple of months ago. And um, so I really come into this with a lot of library background and um, went back to school and took some more classes about another half a master's several years ago and got into archival work at that point, uh, which I've enjoyed very much. It brought me back full circle to my undergrad as a history. But for me, it's information management. Everything about it really has been information management, although I love the historical stories that we discover all the time. So we're going to look at some um, things that will just be very practical, I hope, that you can take back and use not only in your libraries, but also in your, your own personal belongings. We all have family heirlooms that we want to preserve. Uh, we also all have people who ask us for advice on those sorts of things. So um, I hope that this uh, hits on several levels. Um, just an overview of basic preservation for paper-based items today. Please don't ask me about digital or electronic media. <laughs> I keep saying when we start getting the email to archive, I'm going to retire at that point because uh, it's not my era so much. But, um, but we're going to look at just what constitutes an effective preservation environment, um, the effects of proper housing and storage, specifically take a little look at pest control uh, and mold prevention, things that crop up in libraries all the time. Um, I'll show you some very inexpensive paper repair techniques, um, clean humidification, and then we'll touch on disaster preparedness and emergency response. You could do almost a complete graduate program in any one of these areas. So this is going to be overview. And here we go. Well, the main thing with anything we're trying to preserve is that we are fighting with Mother Nature. Everything that we are trying to preserve, if it's paper-based in particular, is organic. And there are... Um, you know, just at the molecular level, it is decomposing right before our eyes. We cannot completely stop that process. We can do some things that will significantly slow it down, and we can do some things that will preserve the information on the paper medium. Um, but photos, papers, books, that's all organic, and it is decomposing. Um, so a lot of it just comes down to providing the right environment for storage. And the four main tenets of a good preservation environment are that it should be cool, dry, and dark, and that the item should be as flat as possible. So when I give workshops or when we teach classes in this, I always say, if you don't leave with anything else, remember cool, dry, dark, and flat, and you will really be ahead of the game in 
in play. Um, cool just refers to the temperature of the environment. Dry refers to the relative humidity. And there are particular ranges. Things, paper-based things like to be on the cool and dry side. And it needs to be a constant, steady temperature and humidity, not an average. If you have you know, peaks and valleys, that really stresses the paper as it encounters those. So cool and dry, pretty consistently. In the dark, that talks about the effect of UV rays. We are getting UV rays in here right now behind the closed curtains off of the lights um, overhead. And um, so we want to store things so that they are not getting that UV hit. We know what it does to our skin. It does bad things to paper, too. And if you think about a newspaper that lays in your driveway all day, and how brown it is at the end of the day, well, that's highly acidic paper it's printed on. So it's not meant to last. But you are seeing UV damage over the day as well. So um, over time, it really accumulates. And then to keep things flat as much as possible, without really going into the chemistry behind paper, um, paper is made of fibers. And when we fold paper against the grain, we actually are damaging the fibers along that fold. And that's so, you know, if you want to tear paper, you do it with your fingernail and then you rip it apart. You see all those little fuzzy things. That's the paper fibers. Anytime that we fold paper, we're stressing those fibers. Anytime that we roll paper up tightly, we're stressing those fibers. So we want to keep things as flat as possible. Now, if you have a map that is like one I worked on, you know, 18 feet wide and 25 feet long, you know, no, no map cabinet has been built that's going to hold that. But there are ways to keep it flatter than just, you know, fold it up and stuff it into a box someplace. So we'll look at those a little bit. But cool, dry, dark, and flat, four basic tenets of a good preservation environment. We have these little critters called PEM monitors in our stacks around our building. It stands for Preservation Environment Monitor. And um, these cost a couple hundred dollars a piece. Um, we have them in our stacks and anywhere that we have original records in our building, so in our galleries as well, in our research rooms. And they take readings of the temperature and humidity every so many minutes. And once a quarter, I put a flash drive in there and pull all that information off, dump it into some software on my computer and generate a report, and send it off to Washington, D.C. so that the higher ups know what we're doing or not doing or need to do. Um, but it's very useful information because it really does tell us um, you know, how we're doing on the, on the temperature and humidity. It's hard data. Um, you may well have an HVAC system that would be able to provide you reports on this kind of environmental uh, control in your building. And I tell people, if you really have no budget at all, at the very least, hang a thermometer on the wall and pay attention to it. You know, take a daily reading every, you know, at the same time every day so that you actually know what's going on. Um, if you are in your stack and it feels uncomfortable to you, it's uncomfortable for your records or your paper-based um, products as well. So we really do need to pay attention to this. <clears throat> Proper storage is really important. We um, store our, our records in boxes that are the right size and shape. Um, as you can see in this picture, this is a this is a record center, a record storage box, but it is made so that it's the right size for these folders. They look like legal folders. Um, it has handles at the end, so it's easy to handle. It has a box that goes over the top, a lid that goes over the top of the box. So um, you know the the folders are standing up straight. They're not slumping. They're not crowded. Um, these are properly stored records. If you're thinking, I don't know what you have in your collection, but this goes for file cabinets <clears throat> as well. Um, if you pull a file drawer open and things go, you know, kind of uh, ruffle across the top, it's too full. You need to do something about that. If, on the other hand, they're really slumping, that's not supporting them well either. So, um, you know, you need to use proper kind of housing. Now, 
I brought in one of the boxes that we use in our staff for records. This is made out of acid-free material. Um, the records that we have are old, and they're generally on acidic paper, which is slowly deteriorating over time. So we try to put as much acid-free material in physical contact with it. So the folders inside the box are made of acid-free material. The box is made of acid-free material. It slows down the acidic deterioration. When I close the lid on the box, the records inside are in the dark. The box can be sitting out in the room. It takes the UV hit. The records inside are in the dark. And this is easy to handle. This is a good size. So um, this is the kind of thing that we do. The metal reinforcements really help the box in strength. Okay, the question. What is too cold and like what is too healing? I understand from a good desire, but I'm hoping this room is not a good desire. But like what would be too cold for a record? Um, the question is what would be too cold for record? I am in just a moment going to give you the uh, optimal range for things. I hate to quote it off the top of my head because I'll be wrong. <laughs> um, for things that are oversized, we use map drawers. Um, we have lots of big oversized things. We have lots of Army Corps of Engineer records. These people make maps about everything, maps, charts, diagrams. Um, so we have lots of those things, and we like to store them flat. So again, these are in big folders that are made of acid-free material, and they're stored in map cabinets. When the doors shut, the records are in the dark, and they're well supported. When we have things that are just too big to go in map cabinet, we actually roll them around the outside of an acid-free tube. Um, you can buy these tubes in different diameters, generally three inches or six inches is what we use. Different lengths, I usually order them in four foot and six foot lengths. Um, so we roll them loosely around the outside of the tube. You know, if you roll something up and stick it inside a tube, what's the first thing it does? springs open, right? And then you can't get it out. You grab, you fish out a corner and the whole thing spirals out and damages. When we wrap things around the outside of the tube, it doesn't create that tension on the paper. And then we wrap it in Melonex, which is just a polyester film that does not off-gas over time. It's completely stable uh, to keep it clean. So we tie it with cotton tool tape. Nothing here that's going to rust over time. And then we store them fully supported on shelves. So it's, it's not truly flat, but it's a lot flatter than it was when we got it. Because <laughs> we do get them all curled up as tight as uh, they can be. And it really is the best that we can do. Just looking at some enemies to preservation. I mentioned acid. Acid and lignin are chemicals that are naturally present in paper. And lignin is the chemical in wood that makes a tree trunk stand up and wreck. Is great in the tree trunk, but in paper, <laughs> it deteriorates over time. So basically, acidic paper is deteriorating from the inside out over time. And as I said, we can't completely stop that, but we can slow it down by putting as much acid-free material in physical contact with the paper as possible. So uh, we even sometimes just interleave sheets of acid-free um, copy paper because it puts more acid-free material in physical contact. Um, dirt and rust are very corrosive and can obscure information on the record. Rust comes from uh, paper clips, um, we find straight pins, staples, brads, any kind of metal fastener will oxidize over time. It does not have to get wet. Uh, and it, it eats through the paper. Um, so you'll get a hole in the paper. You may also just have information that's obscured. Pests, I'm going to talk a little bit more about in detail, light I've talked on. Water um, is, you know, the humidity in the air is water, um, which is not so good for paper. But um, also a flood, and any kind of an emergency that you have is going to involve water of some kind. And we'll look at that a little bit more in detail. So just to prevent pests, the best thing to do is not to let them get started in the first place. So you want to present a good preservation environment that's stable, cool, dry, 
temperature is really not that inviting in the critters. So, um, and for pests, we're talking about both rodents and insects here. So you want to keep things really clean. Be really careful where you store your food. You should never have food around your records or your books or anything like that because people's sticky fingers get on there, it's going to get spilled. Um, it's inadvertent, but it does happen. Um, weather stripping will help keep them outside where they belong. One of the things that we do is like, you know, in landscaping, we don't have anything that's planted directly up against the building. All of our landscaping is set out a couple of feet with a concrete barrier, like a sidewalk around there. Um, so it really helps that we don't get the bugs so much that way. Um, don't use poison bait, because if you do put out poison bait, whatever critter um, that eats it is going to not die politely there where you put the bait. It's going to crawl up in some hidden corner and die and smell bad and become a food source for other critters. So we um, use sticky bug traps. We actually have them in different places around the stacks, around the building. We have a contract with a pest control a company that they come and check out the traps for us every month. Um, and we keep a log of anything that we cite in the building. That's something else I get emailed because I'm the preservation person. Down the road. Not so fun, um, but we keep a log. And then the the working guy can look and see what we've been dealing with. And every so often we get a little outbreak of something. We had a lot of millipedes a couple of years ago that were just really freaking some of our student employees out. Another one of those wormy things with all the legs, you know. Um, just kind of have to keep dealing with them when we finally got rid of them. Um, for us, our dumpster is around on the back side of the building and our stacks are on the front. So just that physical separation is important. Anything that you have um, shipped in is likely to bring um, passengers with it as well. So you really want to be careful about crates, um, pallets, shipping, packing materials, because you can easily get insects um, that come in with them. Um, so we unpack those kinds of things on our dock, not in the processing room, not in our stacks. Just some things that affect paper longevity, um, just in general. How much acid is in the paper? Acid-free paper certainly does not deteriorate like acidic paper. Not all paper is equally acidic. Old newspaper clippings are some of the worst. Old telegrams are really bad. We have those a lot in our records. Um, how it's been stored. Has it been flat? Has it been rolled or folded? Just how it's been handled in the past. How it's been cared for. Uh, you know, I had someone call me this week. She had um, found a stash of Civil War era letters from her family. And because they had been stored in the dark, in a wood box, wood's not so great because it's acidic, but in the dark and in a fairly cool, dry place, they're very legible, they're in good shape. You know, she just wanted to know how to preserve them uh, going forward. So, um, exposure to UV rays, pests, all the things that we've talked about really affect how long paper products will last. Also, there are things like what kind of ink was used. You know, there is some kind of ink that actually has iron in it and will oxidize over time. Just if that's its inherent quality. Um, fountain pen ink tends to fade. Um, it, it really just depends on what kind of ink we use. Um, temperature, humidity, air pollution can be very um, corrosive. So these are all factors that determine or affect how long the paper item will last. A lot of times we have old books and scrapbooks. I get lots of questions about dealing with old scrapbooks, especially. If you have an old book, you want to make sure that the covers are supported so that the book doesn't slump. Um, so use bookends. It's really a nice, you know, very handy thing that is very effective. Um, if it's really large, it should lay flat on the shelf. A coffee table book is meant to lay on a coffee table or a shelf. It's not meant to stand up. Its spine will not support it over time. Um, you know, the way that you remove a book from a shelf makes a lot of difference. It's easy to want to just put your finger on the top and pull down on the top, and that will rip that binding. So if you have things that are special, or that you 
really want to preserve. Um, if you keep your books pulled out to the front of the shelf, but there's a little room behind them, push the two, the one on each side in, that gives you room to get a grip on the spine and just pull it straight out from the middle. It's a very simple thing, but people don't think about that. And um, it really will help preserve the spine over time. Scrapbooks really should be stored in a box. And people who um, want to know what to do with their family scrapbooks, that's kind of a problem. And you may have scrapbooks that have been donated to you at some point. Um, scrapbooks tend to be put together on really acidic paper. And um, they're just kind of crumbling a lot of the time. The binding is really lousy. And they weren't really manufactured to last in the first place. But yeah, there's a full of cool stuff. So I really encourage people to go through and take extensive digital photographs of everything in the scrapbook. If there are items that open up, like an invitation or a program, open it up, take a picture of the inside. Thoroughly document that digitally. Then put the whole thing away in an acid-free box. You can um, pad it with some just um, acid-free tissue paper if you need to. Box with a lid, put it in a place like a bedroom closet. Um, and that will really be really good for it in the long run. Um, and then share the digital copies. Don't share the original. You know, if you have researchers who want to look at it, they need to look at the digital copies. If they don't look at the original, it shouldn't be handled anymore, but it should be retired. Loose papers should be put in um, acid-free sleeve folders or in uh, plastic sleeves. And you always want to avoid anything that says PVC on it because PVC off-gasses acid basically over time. Um, but sleeves made of polyester, um, polyethylene, um, that's a good one, but there's three polys. Um, and they'll say archival quality on the package. Those don't off-gas, as I say, when they'll do nothing to harm it. Then you can handle that uh, letter or whatever it is in the sleeve. You're not touching it. You can read it through there. You can photocopy it. You can photograph it. You can display it that way if you wanted to, but you're not handling it anymore. And you're not getting any oil from your fingers off. You want to avoid folding things more than once. Uh, we do usually fold things once. We make them fit in a folder you know, if we really need to. Um, but we don't fold them up five or six times and just stuff them in there. And we can roll things that are very large. Um, preservation photocopies really are a great idea on acid-free paper. Uh, this is especially good for newspaper clippings because that newspaper clipping is going to continue to deteriorate over time. So if you make a preservation photocopy of it, you preserve it as it is right now. And then you can, again, retire the original. Put it in a, a sleeve, an acid-free sleeve, um, but put it away in the dark in an acid box and um, make your photocopies on acid-free paper. You could also make digital copies and save one. But photocopies, you don't have to have any hardware or software to access them. You know, a piece of paper in your hand is a great thing a lot of time. Very handy. So here we go, the ideal storage environment for documents and books. Um, a cool, stable temperature in the 68 to 72 degree range. Stable humidity of 40 to 50 percent. You want to keep it in the dark. And remember that your um, it's not only sunlight, but it's fluorescent lights that have UV uh, coming off of them and are properly stored. Photographs are a little bit different. <clears throat> There's a lot of chemistry going on in photographs, and there are so many different kinds of photographs. I actually had an intern with me six weeks this summer specializing in photography preservation. She was in a graduate program just for that. And I really envied her because it was so cool, you know, the stuff that she was learning. But boy, she could rattle off the particulars about different kinds of photographs. Um, so each photograph, depending on when it was taken, who took it, how it was developed, how it's been stored, it's going to have individual chemistry and its physical makeup that will determine, to some extent, how long it will last. But these other things are still important. You want to keep them out of um, direct sunlight, so it's limit exposure to UV rays. How you handle photographs is really important. They should be either sleeved or you should be wearing gloves. 
We don't wear gloves to handle paper documents because we think the gloves actually make you a little bit clumsy. You lose the dexterity. So we say wash your hands, continue to wash your hands, because a lot of times our records are old and grimy and our hands get dirty from handling the records. So we'll wash your hands again if you think you're having a problem. But um, with photographs, you should always wear, wear gloves or they should be sleeves, one or the other. Um, how they've been stored is important on photographs. They um, take a little bit more care. The temperature is a little bit cooler for photographs, and the humidity is a little bit drier. The um, emulsion on photographs will become tacky in high humidity and easily damaged at that point, and you'll also get a little mold growth going. So you want to have it a little bit cooler, a little bit drier. Um, air pollution, again, can be very corrosive to photographs, and bugs and rodents like to eat photographs just like anything else that's paper-based. So um, they're a little bit specialized, but a lot of the same factors still apply. So the ideal storage environment for photos, 65 to 70 degrees, a little bit cooler, 35 to 50 humidity, a little bit drier, and again, should be stable and keep them in the dark. Um, polyethylene, polypropylene, polyester. I told you there were three polys. I couldn't remember one of them. You don't want PVC, but anything made of polyethylene, polypropylene, or polyester um, will be a good sleeve. There are also paper sleeves made of acid-free material that, are also, that can be very good for photographs as well. When we think about preserving photographs, Again, it's the heat and humidity that can be very damaging to them. It makes the emulsion sticky. You should always store photographs flat. We actually find photographs that have been folded to fit the box by the cord. And <clears throat> anyway, we say that takes enough cord sometimes. But um, that it really ruins wherever they've been folded. The emulsion is cracked and is ruined at that point. So photographs in particular need to be stored flat and they need to be sleeved or handled with gloves. Now some things you should avoid using um, on your documents and photographs. And you know, this in particular, think about your own personal items um, as well. Anything that you are creating that you think you want to save or someone in your family might think it's an heirloom someday. Because you can be proactive on this up front, you know, when you create things. But these are, um, this is kind of the list of all the supplies that archivists hate. Because they cause problems over the long run. And transparent tape, we've got a lovely photograph here of a document that somebody just went tape happy on it. And, you know, the problem with this is it's a quick fix. It's very pragmatic. And if it's not something that you're going to keep for a long time, it's fine. I put tape on things. But if it's something I'm going to keep, well, I need to know that over time the adhesive will dry out and fail and the cellophane will, you know, come off. And then what I have is a document that is still torn, still coming apart, and now it's got tape residue on it. And to get that off, you really have to go to a conservator. Then we're getting into solvents, and archivists don't deal with solvents. That's conservators wrong. So um, we just say, don't do that. Um, the same thing is true with white glue over time, dries out, it fails, rubber cement, yuck, stuff that it leaves behind, you know, you can rub it up on your fingers. Mm. Um, one of the things that we've run into a lot are those self-stick magnetic photo albums. You know, <clears throat> they really are terrible because there's nothing acid-free about them for the most part. And the, um, the, the uh, clear sheet that lays over the photographs eventually will just kind of become one with the photograph. I mean, it all just sort of runs together as one big mess. Um, so I tell people that if they're trying to deal with one of these, if you can get this, the sheet off the top so that the photograph is exposed, you can take a piece of dental floss and just work it back and forth under the photograph to get it to lift off, because otherwise you're trying to bend that photograph, you know, to peel it off, and you may damage it. But dental floss really works pretty well that way. 
Um, if you can't get them off that way, then really the best thing to do is to take digital photos of the photos uh, so that you at least have the, the original in the state that it is at this point and move forward. And Val, you'll never use one of those again. Um, PVC page and photo protectors are out there. You know, we, they're very common. They're cheap. Um, things that are archival quality or acid free tend to be more expensive. Um, so we find these and they generate acid as they break down and it actually speeds up the deterioration of the item that you're supposed to be protecting. Any kind of metal fastener will rust over time. Um, so one of the things, if you are dealing with things yourself and you're tempted to repair something, um, think, can I undo this without damaging or changing this document at all? And if the answer is no, then don't do it, okay? We can put something in a sleeve, I take it out of the sleeve, nothing has changed. I put tape on it, I've changed it. So. Um, should not, it should always be reversible. Now, if you have torn records, uh, one thing that you can do is encapsulate or sleeve them. So this is, well, what do you do if you can't use tape? Okay. So we've got a picture here of um, a, uh, an exhibit from a court case, actually. And it was just kind of on old cardboard sort of paper and had completely fallen apart, and we didn't know what it was. So one of our archivists took it out to our preservation lab and laid all the pieces out, just like a puzzle, where there was no picture on the cover, and figured out what it was. And it was a picture of a boiler. And, you know, we find all kinds of things in court cases. Um, it was an exhibit, and so it was kind of a cool picture. So now we've got this big thing, you know, what do we do with this? So um, we actually, made a very large sleeve that was welded all the way around so that it's um, encapsulated in that now. And it was just a custom thing that we that we were able to make. Uh, it will always have to be stored flat. If we had a researcher who wanted to look at this, we would probably take a digital photograph of it and serve that to them and say, I'm sorry, you can't look at the original because it just is too um, uh, fragile to actually transport. But do the same thing. If you have a, you know, a letter that has fallen apart of the fold, just a nice letter-sized sleeve, reassemble it in there. There's enough static electricity built up inside the sleeve to hold those pieces in place. Then you can handle it. It really works very well. You have not used any tape on it. Now, one thing you can do for things that are maybe not a permanent value, but very pragmatic things, um, that you do need to repair, uh, you can use heat set tissue. And this is something that actually I've put, this PowerPoint is on the conference website along with the others, and I've put pretty explicit directions here on how to do this, um, thinking that I was not going to be able to actually demonstrate. But um, heat set tissue, is um, just a material that has, it's a neutral pH tissue, so acid free, uh, combined with an acrylic adhesive. It's a lot like if you sew, you know, kind of like iron-on interfacing, it's that kind of concept, only it's more of a tissue. And so what you need is this little tacking iron, um, some, a sheet of heat set tissue, and then a sheet of silicone release paper. And basically, all you do is you preheat the tacking iron, you cut a strip of the heat set tissue to fit whatever your tear or your little hole is. You want to you know, have a little bit of overlap around the outside. Um, if you have a scarf tear, you know, when something tears and it's kind of like the, the paper actually split, and so you've got some over here and some over here, you want to make sure that it's laid the right way, not long the right way. Um, you line it all up. You kind of pack it down, the heat set tissue down with the shiny side down, because that's the uh, adhesive side. Pack it into place just to position it. And then you use the silicone release paper, which nothing will stick to. Uh, put that down, iron over it, basically. And uh, then if you want to do the whole process again on the back side for extra strength, you can. Um, then you, if there's any that extended over the side, you just trim it down. 
This is an easy technique. It takes a little bit of practice. So if you're interested in it, and it's really fairly inexpensive, you can buy all of these materials from, you know, Gaylord or any library supply company. Um, takes a little bit of practice, but it's kind of fun. And I brought a little um, example. This is just the um, tacking iron. You can see at the uh, temperature control. Yeah. Heat set tissue and silicone release paper. And if you want to come up and look at these afterwards, you're welcome to. I also have a map here that I did a lot of heat set tissue repair on. So this was one that came out of my glove box. Um, and you know, all the corners had holes worn in it. And so when I learned to do this, I wanted something that would be useful. My daughter lives in St. Paul and we need this map sometimes. So um, if you want to look at this afterwards, you can see that every place is folded. I've reinforced it on both sides with heat set tissue. It can be refolded at this point. It really is a very strong repair. Didn't take very long at all. The other thing I said, things need to be reversible. You can take heat set tissue off if you need to just by reheating and taking it off. Um, humidification is another thing that's really a great simple paper repair. Um, I know I said that humidity is bad for paper, but in a controlled environment, humidity is really very good for paper. If you think about old, brittle paper, one of the reasons that it's in the state it's in is because it's become too dry. So we can very gently reintroduce humidity to it through the humidification process. Um, these are pictures of humidification chambers in our preservation lab. And these are about four by six feet. They are, we're set up there to really deal with these oversized uh, records that we get. Um, but you can see in one of the uh, pictures, I've got some records in there. You know, something has been folded up. Um, you know, we get old court records that are actually tri-folded records and they've been stored tri-folded for a hundred and whatever years. And they're not going to easily unfold at this point. And they're very difficult to even scan or photocopy. And we can't safely use them until we get them to lay down, you know, relax. So um, this is the process that we go through is putting them through this humidification chamber. Um, usually it's an overnight process. And then we layer them between sheets of heavy blotter paper with plexiglass plates on the top. This is just a small humidification chamber that I made um, that we use for smaller things. It's on the very same um, principle, exactly like the big ones. And this is one that you could easily make at home. This is just a rubber bank cut, okay? So nothing that will rust, nothing that will rust you. In the bottom, we have a sheet of thick blotter paper that's been cut to fit. So what I would do is pour warm water on here. The blotter paper soaks up all the water. So in this case, I don't have any standing water at all, but it's really wet. And warm, too, warm water. This is, we call it egg crate. It's, you find it at the hardware store. It goes in fluorescent light fixtures, plastic. Lays on top. And then um, for this one, I added a sheet of, this stuff is called Polytex or Reme. It's a spun polyester. It's a lot like interfacing. Again, it won't break down. It's very neutral. Um, that lay it over the top so that um, occasionally a very delicate record could be kind of, kind of embossed with that egg crate pad if you weren't careful. The records go in here on top, and then the lid goes on. And it's um, an airtight, it's a pretty airtight uh, environment, very warm and humid in there. The records just, it's very passive though, no fans, no mechanics going on here. Um, I've done this same setup at home with a Tupperware container and toilet paper towels, okay? So, I mean, you really can improvise this. Um, 
leave them in there for, it depends on what you're putting in, how old it is, how thick it is, but um, if they're old letters, anything with a fountain pen, you would just really watch it because the ink will run as it starts to solidify. So that may only take 20 or 30 minutes. Other things may need to be left in over time. Um, but then the next day, you take them out, layer them between sheets of blotter paper with a weight on top, let them dry overnight, but they come out looking just like they've been ironed almost. And they're really very supple and much easier to handle at that point when they just relax. Any damage that was there from a fold is still there. It doesn't make the folds go away. They're just laying flat at that point. Now, is there any way to get the smell out? Like we get a lot of books donated for our library. And some are, you know, in better condition than the ones we have on the shelf. And they have like this funky vapor. It probably indicates some mildew or something. I mean, anytime you smell something, it's an indication of deterioration. Oh. So I'd be really cautious about letting those back in yeah. uh, with the other things. Now, what if we had documents that we have to save? Um, we recently had a centennial celebration, like 125 years ago, maybe. They had a time capsule in the ground. They pulled it up, a bunch of newspapers, and we couldn't want them to save them, but they had that smell. Okay. Um, Okay, so the question, I'm sorry, I forgot to get the question on So the question is about smelly things. Okay, it must be odor. Um, I think what you're going to need to do is just keep them segregated as much as you can. So you can sleeve them, you can encapsulate them, uh, you can put them in separate boxes. But if there is that smell, there is something chemical going on that may not be a good thing to have around the rest of your collection. Yes, segregating them is a good thing instead of quarantine them. I'll take one more question, then we have to keep going. Yes. What about cigarette smell? I mean, we may have a different kitchen, but we're not trying to preserve it. If we want to get this, you know, stained out, we're still taking it. Cigarette smell from just a circulating book. I don't really have a good answer to that. The best answer might be replace the book. <laughs> I've got some examples of some different humidification chambers. I just went out and found these online um, just to give you an idea of how creative you can be in coming up with one of these. This top one, the trash can within a trash can, this is very common. And it's really great if you have mold posters or tubes, something like that. Um, but basically, you have a big trash can, you have a small trash can that sits inside of it. The records go in the small trash can, you pour water around the outside. So there's no water touching the records. You put the lid on, you get the humid environment. Um, the two underneath, I've seen these frequently as well, and I've seen uh, a lot of conservation labs where they will set these up in their big oversized stainless steel sinks, actually. Run some water in the bottom, put a tray or a box of some kind on top of that, and then put a piece of plexiglass over the top. So again, you're creating some kind of enclosed, passive, humid environment here. You never want water touching your document, but they have to be separated in some way. But these are just some examples. So you can really think about what you have to work with. You'll find stuff in your kitchen that works, I guarantee it. Uh, and then when you um, stack humidified documents to dry, you can just do all the weights on top, or you can do a layer of weights in the middle and another layer of weights on top, just so long as it's all same size and thickness and um, whatever works for the space that you have. Um, if you're doing this at home, like I said, I've used just white paper towels. Be careful about anything that's printed ink on paper towels could run. Um, but just white ones are fine. Mold is a fungus that's composed of long filaments and it eats whatever it's living on. So that's why when you have moldy cheese, you cut a nice big margin, I hope around when you cut off the little blue corner um, because there are, it's sending roots down into whatever it's living on, into that substrate that you can't see. So um, there are inactive mold spores all around us in the air all the time. We can't really filter them out. As long as they're inactive, they don't really bother us. It's when we get a spike in heat and humidity 
that they become active, and then our allergies flare up and we get active mold growth on our record. So temperature over 75 degrees, relative humidity over 60 percent, you have a small window of time in which to do something about this situation. 48 to 72 hours, and you can expect active mold growth. So what you need to do is, if you have things that are damp, um, get them into a freezer. Actually, putting things in a freezer will stop mold growth in its tracks, and it buys you time. Um, when you're handling things that have become moldy, you want to be careful of your own health. So wear a face mask. Wash your hands frequently. And really be careful. As once you get active mold growth going, it will continue to crop up. And I'm aware of at least one library that moved in to its new facility before the HVAC system was truly regulated and within a month had water dripping from its skylights on the collection. And they have a continual um, mold remediation facility set up on the back side of the building now, netted outside, and they're just constantly looking for things. And she uses everything from hands to kitty litter to freezers to you name it, you know. Um, but you need to be really be careful of it. Um, I have some really lovely pictures of mold damage here. Once things, once mold becomes inactive, which happens when we get it into a cool and dry environment, those mold spores can be brushed or vacuumed away. Um, but they will leave behind permanent stains, and so the information can be obscured at that point. These are some records that we had. We opened up a box of court records that apparently had been wet at some point, and nobody knew it. And it was just a carpet of mold was at the top of that box. And these are permanent records, and the government says we have to keep them. So we had to deal with it. And we had people with masks and vacuums going for a while until this was um, dealt with. But they were binders of court records. And you can see here where the paper actually has been eaten away by the mold. And it just went right across the top of all those pages. So it, you know, hit the top the edge and just went right down. So we really had some fairly significant loss. And it even was on the outside of the binders. We opened the binders up, the paper came apart. It was a disaster. So don't let this get started. Go back to that temperature and humidity is the thing. If, you, if your HVAC system fails, remember you've got a small window of time to act. And if you have things that are wet, get them in a freezer. So moving on to our last area of disaster response. Um, when disaster strikes, and it will, preparation is the key. So thinking ahead, because I can guarantee you, at some point in your career, you will deal with some kind of a disaster. I've been through a fire and a uh, massive water leak at this point. So. And then I had a school library that had a really leaky roof right over the kitchen section. So, you know, it was, uh, these things just happen. Um, the disaster recovery, remember that if things actually burn up, if they're actually charred, that damage is irreversible. What we can usually deal with is smoke damage, you know, smoke corrosion left behind can be cleaned up, and water will be involved in just about anything that you deal with. Um, having been through a fire, I can tell you it was a very small fire. The fire department was very enthusiastic with how much water they poured on it. Okay? <laughs> so we had way more smoke and water damage than we had of anything that actually burned. Um, and, you know, in the loop, the, I had a children's library directly below that fire, and it was flooded. So um, wasn't even in the area that was burning, but just it was the water that was poured on it. Um, if you have things that get wet in a flood or a leak or whatever, really quick action is important. You can't air dry things. The paper will buckle. It will not be nice when it's done nice and smooth. But if you put them in a freezer, it actually will freeze dry. And we had a water leak in our stacks um, about a year and a half ago from a bullet that had pierced a seam in our flat roof on our brand new stacks. So people shoot bullets at federal buildings, apparently. And um, which is very comforting to all of us to know that we had torrential downpour, water finds that hole, finds its way down. We had 56 boxes of wet records. 
And uh, everybody got called into work who wasn't there. We did a massive refoldering, reboxing, and we sent them off to a basically a freezer facility that we have access to as the federal government. Then we brought them out. We left them there for several weeks. They, the boxes, you know, they were tight, uh, fully packed boxes. Um, the papers really just freeze dried right there. We took them out, held boxes at a time, laid them out between a lot of paper, let them thaw out so that any moisture that remained, we lost absolutely no information. I mean, it was really tremendous. It was months of recovery work on that. Um, so really, getting things into a freezer, you won't get mold growth, and it will really start to freeze dry. So it's a really good idea. If you really need something to be fixed, Afterwards, you need to consult a conservator. It's expensive, but it's an investment. It's something that you really do need to keep. Don't try to deal with it yourself. And disaster will occur at some point. Pipes burst. <laughs> Fires break out. You know, it just happens. Um, so you need an emergency response plan that the staff is trained on. And they include your volunteers, your custodians, all of your staff. Um, our water leak was discovered by a student who happened to take the long way back around at Dax instead of coming out the more direct way. It could have been a lot worse. She caught it when they both been going on for probably an hour or two. If it had been on a Saturday night and it had gone on all weekend, yeah, I wouldn't be here probably. Um, <laughs> I'd still be working on it. So preventive measures, fire safety inspections, make sure your exits are um, accessible. Your vital records need to have backup off-site so that everything's not in the same place. Your emergency supplies should be stored near your stacks. We now have enough plastic sheeting pre-cut to cover our entire stacks. It stores outside the stacks. So it's not down in the basement, no, where is that? You know, it's right there in really well-labeled um, uh, shelving. Be careful of what you're storing near the stacks, chemicals, anything that would um, flame up, fire drills, and be sure that you know who your recovery contractors will be before you need them. Just like the way the uh, tow trucks shows up before the police when you have a wreck, um, when you have a fire, I can tell you that your recovery contractor will be there right along with the fire department. They may not be the best people. So remember, everything is water, um, roofs leak, so you will have water involved in just any kind of an emergency. Um, anything that you have will require a custom solution. So there are basics that you also need to stop, consider what you have going on right here, consider human safety. You don't want to you know, wade into water all over the floor. If the electricity is not off, you can get electric. So you need to think safety, not heroic. And people don't always do that in the heat of the moment. Um, throughout the rest of this PowerPoint, I know we're out of time. I've just given some real specifics that I would encourage you to go and look at the PowerPoint online. Um, some just ways to immediately respond, how to stabilize the area. Set up recovery zones by medium so that it will be much more efficient in the way that you deal with things. Um, the way that you pack things out is really important. Everything needs to be documented so that you can find every box or every book or whatever it is at any time and know where it's located. And if you have photographs that are wet, they need to be kept wet and then you need to get a conservator into the act. These are lists of emergency supplies. Um, a number of these things we already have on site, on hand, before we need them, so because they're really first response things. There's other things you will think about first, you know, drinking when the time comes. I have enough masks and goggles for a whole staff. I have not bought steel toed boots for everyone. So there's that. Um, just some specifics on recovering things. Paper, as I said, you want to freeze it uh, as much as possible. Be really careful. You can get insects and pests going in here too. Photographs are really delicate when they get wet. So you want to be very careful with them. If they are wet, keep them wet um, and keep them cold so you don't get mold growth going on them. 
And so these are just some additional websites that are good sources of information on preservation in general and some sources for archival supplies. And that's it. <laughs> And um, if you have any additional questions, I'm glad to hang around for a little bit and talk to you personally. So thank you very much for having me here.